On behalf of the Arts Benicia board and staff, I welcome you. I'm Celeste Melan, director at Arts Benicia, and I really am so pleased, and I thank every one of you, each and every one of you, for being here. This is such a good opportunity, and I'm really pleased that we are all here in attendance. Thank you so much, Constance, for filming this. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as uh, Celeste said, I'm Lori Tinfo. I'm the city manager. Hi. I'm the city manager for the city of Benicia, and I'm happy to be here to both share information with you and hear you, more about your concerns. Um, as part of that, I wanted to let you know who's in the room from the city side. We brought a big team because we wanted to, one, communicate how important this is to us, and two, um, hopefully have everybody here who will need to answer your questions. So with that, I'm just going to read, oh, I forgot my list of names. Um, could all the staff just stand up? And then I will go around and say their names just so that you know who's in the room. So this is David Dodd. He is the Library and uh, Community Services Director. This is a new addition, Tim Barrow from TRB. This is Rachel O'Shea. You might have emailed her. She's the Chief Building Official. Uh, this is Alan Shear. He's the Assistant City Manager. This is I guess you know who Josh is. He's the fire chief because um, of his uniform. This is Eli um, Fleshman, who's our new assistant city attorney. So he's uh, here as well. And then behind him is Eric Upson, the police chief. Ben Stock is the city attorney. And then Laura um, Provencher is my executive assistant. And she's responsible, by the way, for the cookies. So I encourage you to try one. Uh, we the cookies on the table. Homemade, apparently. So anyway, feel free. Um, we put together an agenda to just lay out what we hope to cover. And we want to assure you there's plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. And again, we're hoping to have everybody here that can be able to answer your questions. Um, in addition, uh, we also have um, Erica Lee, from the, who's the property manager, and she's here as well, and she's also on the agenda so that she'll have a chance to speak and or be part of the Q&A. So again, we're hoping we're going to have people here who can answer your questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the messages I want you to know is, again, how important the artist community is to the city. Um, we recognize the role that you've played in our identity um, and how, how, really how beloved you are by the whole town. So I want you to hear that. Um, I also want to acknowledge the alarm that are the notices that we posted last week caused from, for you. We know that. Um, well, we're going to explain a little more about that as part of the presentation portion, but I, I do understand when I saw those, if I had been you, I would have been alarmed as well. Um, I want to emphasize, though, that why we did that and why we're here is the focus on your safety. Um, the ghost ship fire is fresh in everybody's memory, and why the, while the issues might be a little different here, the health and safety of you is still the primary importance. And again, that's why we're here. Um, and also, I'll just note that we have a relationship with the property owner and the manager and that part of the dynamic. And we also have a relationship with you all, but they're different. And uh, so I think um, Josh is going to explain a bit more about what we've been doing with the property owner and then how those notices came into the mix. So Josh, shall I hand this over to you? Sure. Thank you. So again, my name is Josh Chadwick. I'm the fire chief here in the city. And um, before I get into all that, I want to give a little bit of background. So I was hired as a firefighter paramedic in the city of Benicia in 1998. So I'm going on like 21 years here. And in that time, from early on, I've ran calls at different um, you know, tenant spaces in these, in these buildings and, you know, throughout the city. And so I had in the back of my mind, maybe when I was first hired, it didn't click as to what was going on, but I had in the back of my mind some concerns about the safety from, from a long time ago. Um, it wasn't my role really to do much about it or my ability or, or you know, maybe, maybe I should have stepped up and, and said something earlier, but it, it, I just want to let everyone know that, that that safety factor was in my mind. Um, fast forward again, you know, about 19, almost 20 years, I got promoted and, you know, moved up through the ranks and became fire chief. And so as fire chief, around the time that I was promoted, 
uh, originally to interim chief and then to full full fire chief was again around the time that the ghost ship was going on. It was shortly after, but it was still very much in the news. I, you know, I get uh, professional publications sent to me on a regular basis and countless stories that I've read. And there were some serious, um, I'm going to just say mistakes made by the Oakland Fire Department. And you know whether they're copying to it or not, it, it, it got in my mind of that I'm not going to let that happen in my city. You know, my primary responsibility is the safety for the residents, and it has nothing to do with whether it's an artist community or a kayaking community or whatever it is. It, that had nothing to do with it. It's it's the safety of the community. And so I'm sitting there reading these reports and seeing seeing what I'm seeing on the news and talking to colleagues that have that were part of it. And I vowed to not let that happen. So. Somewhere around that same time, we hired a, a new fire inspector. Um, we were short staffed and we hadn't had a fire inspector for quite a long time. And so our inspection, citywide, the inspection, fire and life safety inspection program was, I'm just gonna say dismal, it was not adequate. And so we worked with city council and you know through the city manager's office and, and we were able to finally get approved for a fire inspector position to help us. Because before that we had the engine companies that were the, you know, their job is, putting out fires and do, running medicals and running hazmats and vehicle accidents, that's fire inspections is not their, their specialty. And so that's who I had doing these fire inspections. And they would go through and they would do the best that they could, but they aren't experts at picking out the, the details. Um, from there, we hired the fire inspector. He was relatively new. I had him get his feet wet for you know six months or so in the city with some of the more easier lightweight inspections and then, and then said, okay, now you're ready for going down to the arsenal because I have some serious concerns. I haven't been in these buildings in you know, maybe eight years or so, a lot longer for many of the other ones, but I felt like there were some, some safety concerns that I wanted him to start looking into. Um, that triggered him coming down and starting some inspections. When he started going through the inspection process, he started finding quite a few violations of the fire code. Um, around that same time, he also started realizing that it was beyond the scope of fire, it included building also. Um, so so he, he came to me and said, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best on, on some of these minor, or even in some cases not minor fire code violations. And we had some significant issues with the sprinkler system that we worked through with Erica, right Erica? And, and, and the staff uh, of the property management company, we worked through those and we were slowly plugging our way through, trying to get the worst of the worst figured out first, but like I said, he discovered some building code violations that it's not at the fire department's expertise at. So at that point, we reached out to the building department. Um, unfortunately, the building department was going through some challenges staffing wise, and the director of that department essentially said that they don't have the capacity right now to do it. They're gonna work on hiring some, some outside consultants to help us with the building portion of it, um, but it might take six months. And I felt like I, I once I, once I knew that he had gone in and seen what, some of the things he's, he had seen, I did not feel comfortable just putting this whole thing on pause and waiting for six months for the building department to get um, the staffing to be able to assist and do a coordinated effort together. Um, at that point, he went back in and started just dealing with fire, fire code violations. And I've had a lot of questions as to why we've had an uh, inspector come through pick out some violations, you guys have correct some, in some cases corrected them, and then six months later we're coming back with more, and that's sort of a, it's not meant to be an excuse, but it's meant to be an explanation of how that came to be. Um, at that point, fast forward six months, the building department gets uh, the ability to hire a consultant to come in and do a very thorough fire and building inspection process. They went through that in June-ish, I believe, and went back and started compiling a report. And we knew that there was quite a few issues, but we didn't know how bad, how bad some of them were, how extensive the, the whole picture was. Um, a few weeks ago, we got a report sent to us that was 143 pages and with pictures and details, and it was extensive. And it made us take pause to the point where we felt like we had to address some of these things immediately. Um, at that point, we sat down and we, we talked about, you know, we can't just send a 143-page report. We, we can give it to the owner, but we also have a, a responsibility to let the people that are living in these potentially unsafe spaces know. 
So we talked quite a bit with the, uh, um, with the legal team and city staff about how we were gonna go about that. Um, it wasn't an overnight process. We met on a, a few different occasions and we decided that the best thing to do was kind of parse out this report so that everybody had an individual packet of what their findings were for their space. Um, I'm kind of, I know I'm going kind of way off the agenda. And hopefully, hopefully Lori's not cringing on me here. Uh, so that was really the number one, is how the 143-page report came to be. Um, at that point, we, like I said, we had a responsibility to let the tenants, let all of you know. At, you can make your own decision. I mean, I, I, had, I had a feeling that there might be somebody who got that report and saw what was going on and said, I'm gonna move out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna vacate on my own until this gets fixed. I mean, that was a possibility. There's other people that say, I've been here for you know, 50 years and I don't care, it's safe, it's never had a problem and I wanna stay. And that, that was your own decision to, to make, but we felt like we needed to let you all know that. Um, in addition to that, there were some legal requirements and I, I can't speak to the exact, you know, I, I, we, we have our legal team here that could answer probably those questions, but there were legal requirements for what needed to be in the, that notice. I know a lot of it sounded scary and I think one thing to point out that's important is every one of those posted notices, they were addressed to the owner of the property. They were not addressed to the tenants. We weren't telling the tenants that this is your responsibility 100% on you or you're going to be kicked out. That, and, and I think that kind of got lost in the mix a little bit and I, I want to get that out there. Um, the last thing on my, my agenda was the, the way the notices came specifically with the, the feeling like it came in with a SWAT team coming in and, and, and posting on there. And, and I'll explain a little bit about that. We post notices, you know, an example is a notice got posted today on a house for weeds. Um, the weeds were excessive, it was a, it's a hazard, so part of the process is we mail a letter certified and we post it on the door. When we do that, our code enforcement officer is who posts the notices. Well, when we went, when we got the packets together, we wanted to do it on a, on Friday. It, it, we just, it was too much of a workload. It carried over to Monday. On Monday, we were ready to post the notices. We had them all built and the code enforcement officer was on vacation that day. So, um, you know, the building official and I spoke and we said, well, who can do this? And I said, well, the fire inspectors knows the, the space. We'll have the fire inspector do it. Um, so that was the decision why the fire inspector posted. Then the other parts of this is that whenever we post, we have two people going. We are not scared that you guys are gonna come out, you know, and scream and yell and fight with us, but it, it happens every now and then. So it's just good practice to have two people doing that process. Um, the, the, the process would have been the code enforcement officer and a community service officer from the police department. That's not a police officer with a gun and badge. That's like, uh, Eric can speak to it, but, I believe he or she will wear a, like a white or a light blue shirt and just so you have two people. Well, it, as it would be that the community service officer was in training on Monday. So since when we reached out to PD to ask for the community service officer to assist with the posting, we got back the feedback that she's, she's uh, at training today, but we have an officer available that could help. Perfect, let's send the officer with, with the fire inspector. And my understanding with that is that that officer that was assigned had a trainee with him that day. And so there's now your second police officer. It, optics, it looks different than what it really was. It was meant to just be two city staff members posting on the, do on the door. And I understand the angst that that caused. And you know, I, I, can, I apologize for any fear that that brought, but that's an explanation of how that came to be. Um, that was all on my agenda. I'm sure you'll all have questions later, but we'll move on. Um, I wanted to highlight that this morning I sent out an email with a, a memo, a three-page memo, that gives you some more of the backstory that Josh was talking about. And there are paper copies over on the table. So if anybody didn't get that and would like some more information about what has led up to this, we want to make that available to you. Um, and I'll just add as well that Josh used the word responsibility I would even say it was an obligation that we had to notify you of the standards um, that we found in the buildings and that that report, that 143 page report, really had a, a severe impact on our alarm on your behalf. And so again, I, I'm trying to underscore, please just hear that we just were concerned about your safety and that's why we took these actions. And hopefully 
Josh's under, our explanation for why it was two police officers and a, a fire inspector also, you know, helps allay your concerns a little bit at least. So with that, I'm going to ask Rachel to come up. Hi, I'm Rachel O'Shea. I think I've spoken to a lot of you, either by phone or email or at my counter. So the 72-hour notice, um, everyone has uh, complied with or they have gotten an extension. I think four that are out of the area right now have extensions of time. Uh, the rest, we've discussed individually what your immediate uh, requirements were. Most were smoke detectors, extension cords, uh, maybe not using a few pieces of equipment while we go through the process. Everyone has complied, and I thank you. Right now, uh, we're in the process of re-inspecting over the next week. You probably, some of you had contact with my counterpart, Tim, today, and he'll be, if you haven't, he'll be reaching out to you um, shortly to uh, work on that and getting those inspected. And the next uh, step of the process is, lies with the property manager, and we'll be working through that with them. Thank you, Rachel. And then I think, Erica, this is your opportunity if you want to add anything to what we're sharing or if you simply want to respond to questions, that's, that's fine too. But we certainly wanted to give you an opportunity. Hi, everyone. Um, I've met some of you. I haven't met all of you. Um, you know, it, with, as far as everything's going, it, this, at the end of the day, it is about all of your safety. Um, you know, we started off with removing the 40 plus trees in the back there along Grant. We've installed security cameras throughout the entire village here. Um, and we've also installed 13 LED wall pack lights, which I'm sure you all see. Um, we, we also are in, gonna be installing the ADA railing, which is at the city right now. The architect has been out here. I know you all have seen me out here measurements uh, with my fabricator, the structural engineer and such. So we are trying to make everything as safe as possible for all parties involved. Um, it's not something that's um, being pushed to the side. Um, I think with what they're trying to accomplish here is with that ghost fire that everybody's safe when you're sleeping at night, during the day, everything is being um, taken care of as, that sh as it should. Now, with as far as the um, electrical and plumbing issues, I know you all have received my emails, um, and the owner has, is going to be taking care of $100,000 worth of the improvements, plumbing, electrical, and such. So I wanted to let you guys know that we back you. You know, I am your voice, I am the owner's voice. Any questions or concerns that you guys have with regards to any of this, you know, let me know, I can do my best with dealing with the city, the fire chief, the owner, the attorneys. Um, but it, at the end of the day, it's everybody's safety. I know you guys have been here 30 plus years. I've sent um, emails and been corresponding with Eli as well as the owner's attorney as far as items that are, you know, that I don't know if they're grandfathered in, um, items such as escape routes and such. So that is being worked on. Um, and that is not obviously not gonna be a cost to any of you guys. I think the only thing that we have questions is you know, certain items within each individual suites. And just, just to ensure that we have the proper electrical and um, plumbing issues for each of your suites. So that was really all that I had. You know, I'm open. You guys can email me any time of the day. You can call me any time of the day. And I'm here to support you. It's not something that the owner is looking to have anybody vacate. That's not his intentions at all. His, his, his intentions is to have everybody safe and we work together and we can get all this taken care of. That was it. So I guess that's uh, what we have to share with you right now. We're uh, very happy to answer your questions. The thing that I'm curious about, my name is Kim Emanuel. I'm one of the tenants here. Um, the city came and made an inspection, I'm going to guess about 40 days before the notices were delivered to the door. The city gave itself 40 days to respond to the 140-page report, and then it gave everybody here three days to respond with a poorly written document that sounded like an eviction notice to me. I just like an explanation. And then the second thing, 
I think the city owes a sincere apology to everybody in this room because you put us through hell for a few days and we didn't do anything wrong. I, I'm trying to understand completely your question. The, the 40 days, are you talking about why we were, why you were inspected prior? No, no, I get all that. What I don't get is everybody in this room is a collection of artists. We don't have expertise with building roads or fire code or anything like that. Correct. We don't have the infrastructure of city government behind us. We don't have assistance and assistance to assistance. And yet, we, um, you guys came out and did an inspection and it was polite. I'm not complaining about it. I don't think you'll find a single person in this room who said, I'm not doing it, it's, you know, go to hell or anything like that. And yet, you, you sat on that report, you gave yourself a month or more to deal with it, and then when you dealt with it, you came down here and told us we got three days and you're gone. Okay. And I don't think that's fair to us. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, so I think there's a misunderstanding about that there was 40 days. We had that report like two and a half weeks ago. And, and so, yeah, so, so we, it was a huge report to have to work our way through. So we had, and there's, you know, we're also, we have other parts of our job other than this building in these buildings. So we had to get meetings together and sit down and look through it and figure out what we're going to do with it. And really myself and Rachel sat down and we looked and, and we said, okay, right off the bat, we need to pick the, 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 the items that are the most critical and to some extent, the ones that can possibly be done in, in a short period of time. And we said, okay, we're going to start with those. And we started with those, those items that we felt like a smoke alarm could be put in in three days, no problem. An extension cord could be removed in three days, no problem. A bed could be moved in three days, no problem. A stove could have a do not use tag marked on it in three days, no problem. So we picked those items that we thought were the most critical and could be dealt with most immediately, and we put that in the report. And, and we're real, real, real quick, I, I want to just answer your other part of the question. From the bottom of my heart, I apologize if the report, the notice was given and caused you angst and, and it wasn't clear. I, what, what, looking back, what I would like to have done, because all of that information needed to be in there, but it, we could have put a cover page on the front of it that explained uh, in, in, in better terms. And, and we live and we learn, and I, I do. This, if the city owes you an apology from me, I apologize for that. And, and not to just go back and forth on every single item, but just, just to remember that those notices were addressed to the owner and the, the fire code or the health and safety code requires that the owner supply smoke alarms and, and carbon monoxide alarms in multifamily residents. Uh, I'm Mark Gaines, longtime resident. Um, so, go ship. Um, for me, it's personal. I teach for a living, I teach at a college in San Francisco. And one of my dear students perished in that fire. So, for me, it's personal. And when I saw it, I was horrified. But I want to make something very clear to everyone, particularly the city officials here and the fire inspector. Um, to compare the conditions at Ghost Ship to here is ludicrous. I just want to start with that. <laughs> Completely ludicrous. The conditions there were horrific. Yes? And here, this place was built out to code and been maintained over 20 some years apples and oranges. So the heavy handedness of not only your approach, but how we were affected is unconscionable, not to mention unprofessional. That's my feeling. I'm not done yet. <laughs> also, Erica, we need to have a much better line of communication with you personally on an ongoing basis emails and phone calls that are answered in a timely fashion. Yes. <laughs> Which from my personal, nothing personal here between you and me, this is business. And I, there have been improvements that have been needed that was promised to me that I would not have to pay for that have been unanswered for a long, long time. So I have questions that may have to be addressed to the city's lawyers, frankly. <laughs> about just where that separation is between the owner's responsibility, who it's to pay for what, and my responsibility, because there's a lot of gray area there that I'm uncomfortable with. 
and I think I'm not the only one. Who pays for what? You mentioned $100,000. That's great. I'm really happy to hear it. But when push comes to shove and an extra electrical box has to be put in my space, I want to know exactly who's responsible for paying for that. That's all I have for now. I might have more later, but that's all I got for now. My name is Chuck Potter. I'm also a long-term resident here. And I want to dovetail in with what Mark said. In fact, I did a post today on Facebook saying much the same thing. To compare, you know, I'm in property management. I'm a vice president controller for a property management company for over 13 years. I represent my firm's legal. I represent fire rebuild construction. I have a lot of background in this area. In fact, I have built my own place foundation up at my property up north. So I know a little bit about construction codes, fire codes. I've been through a major fire up in uh, Plumas County, much like what Paradise went through, it was in my front yard back in 2000. So I understand the dangers, I understand the concerns, but <clears throat> I want to mention, and I mentioned this at the meeting the other day, in my place, just for an example, they said they want smoke detectors. I had four. They didn't mention the seven fire extinguishers that I have posted all throughout my whole entire place, upstairs, downstairs, with signs that glow in the dark. Nothing was mentioned in that report. You know, and the, the idea to, and I understand the losing of sleep, I've been there. Okay, I deal with it myself at work every day, much like you. But the thing is, is that Ghost Ship was a horror story. And the city of Oakland has a lot to still answer, in my opinion. Not just the people that own that property, the city of Oakland, on why they didn't enforce when they had complaints. Here, we get inspected every five years for hydrostatic, you know, uh, pressure on our... Uh, fire sprinkler system, and then we find out, I think it was last year sometime, that that pressure, although it shows, in, and I'm a substation in our studio, and it shows 100 pounds PSI all the time right on a nice little meter, that we had maybe five minutes of water in case of a fire. And that was like one or two years, what was that, last year, guys? Right? That means, since 1996, when I've been here, through all this time, where were you guys in that fire protection? Why wasn't that addressed? And, and I didn't give you three days to fix it. In fact, you took something like three months. I had hoses going all through where I park, you know, and I had to step over them every day just to get up my stairs. You didn't get three days. You took three months to take care of that problem. And then I was taking pictures of the hydrant that's out at my place, it had been leaking for months and months and months. I sent it to the city, I sent it to Erica, and it finally got fixed. Thank God when all this other stuff got fixed. So we need to kind of control the fear factor here a little bit and settle things down. I don't think anyone here wants to do something stupid like it go ship. But I think at the same time, what we want from our city is a little bit of support and some help. You know, most of us, or some of us, work all day, then we come and work all night to do the artwork. And you have no idea what that entails, because then it's the marketing of the artwork. It's like running basically two jobs for 25 some odd years, okay? And then to have the city come in like it did in a stormtrooper fashion and say, you know, this is a problem. It, when especially when some of us know that's not even a problem, you know, and some of the things I got asked to remove, you know, electric cords and electric extension cords and that, I mean, seriously, I mean, to power a lamp, what about the electric extension cord to power this thing here? Is that a violation? I mean, how, I mean, it, this is where we need a little help from the building inspectors to come and really explain to us why that's an issue. And I think most of us would do something about it if it were. Okay, and that's why I just want, I want some common sense in government, our city of government especially. Common sense. I want to be able to trust you guys. Right now, that's on the line. I'm not too sure. I mean, I don't think I speak for just myself. So I'm glad that you brought up the repair that we made to the water power to the um, sprinklers. It's actually part of this whole effort that Josh was talking about. 
there's new staff and we are looking at things differently and we are taking safety concerns very seriously. And so, yes, we identified that, we came out. It did take three months, but for a city, that's pretty fast. And we got it fixed. And now you guys have appropriate sprinklers um, serving your building. And you know, we know that we did the right thing and that you're in a safe building from that perspective. Um, you know, we can't go space by space by space. And I know that there are differences among the spaces for what kinds of hazards that we identified. There, I, I know that there are some fire hazards, um, and I, I don't want to talk that much about the specifics, but there are fire hazards. Now, to your point about helping you all understand what they are and why those cords are a problem, my understanding is that Rachel has, has tried to help with information along those lines, and I know that she's certainly willing to spend more time explaining things. Um, so we, we do want to help. We do want to provide information to all of you and try to make this transition as, as best as we can. Now, I just want to highlight one other thing, and that is, as Josh mentioned, that notice was addressed to the property owner. And so much of what you've already done, that was um, either your responsibility or not. I, I'm not really sure. I'm not going to weigh into that discussion. But it was things that could be done quickly. And you all did them. It's my understanding is you all did those, those easy things that could really improve the safety greatly. You've already done them, and that's wonderful. A lot of the additional changes really will fall on the property owner and most likely on Erica to manage them. And so we are committed to working with them to make that process go as well as we can. Um, but of course, we don't have control over that side of the whole dynamic. But as I said, we're happy to work with Erica and with the property owner to, on our, to do our part to make this transition smooth. So, The property owner is not being thrown out of his house. If it's his responsibility, why did we get the notices? Why didn't they go to his house, not us? And he did get that notice actually a few days before you all got the notice. And we, we told him to tell you. And he didn't. And then we went out on that Monday and posted the notice as we're required to do. So again, you know, to Josh's point about, gosh, I wish we would have had a cover letter on that that would have helped explain more about what it meant. Um, and so, you know, that was n didn't go as well as it could have. Hi, I'm Greg Renfro. I have a question for uh, Chief Chadwick. Uh, this is slightly off topic, but uh, it's actually really relevant. I was coming over to work today and I thought and realized there's only one way in and one way out of the arsenal. Yes. How will, what, do you have contingencies in place for bringing emergency vehicles in in case there is, God forbid? All right, so, so real quick, there's been a lot said and I, 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 I'm trying not to, I, I wanna address a couple things. So first of all, the comparing apples and oranges to the ghost ship, when we got the notice Myself and Lori were in a, in a conference out of town and we got an email about, about this and we were walking down the street and she, she asked me, is it as bad as the ghost ship or something along those lines? Is it another ghost ship situation? And my answer was no, it's not. I said, it's bad and it's got some work to be done, but it's not as bad as the ghost ship. So, so I recognize that and I agree with that. It's not as bad, but that doesn't take away the fact that if we know there are there are dangers or there are safety concerns, I can't say, well, it's not as bad as the ghost ship, so we're not gonna do it. We're gonna turn a blind eye. I, I just, I'll, I'll take you guys screaming and yelling at me all night long versus sifting through and finding bodies. I'll, I'll just do it every time. So that, that's to answer that one. The, the water situation, the, the day, I, I can't speak to what happened in, with my predecessors and how it past inspections every five years prior. I, I can't speak to that. That was not something I was involved with, but I can tell you that the day I was notified of it, we started working on it. And the temporary fix was we said, we're gonna supply it with hydrant water. And we put those hoses in and I know they were inconvenient and I didn't like how long it took to get it repaired and get the situation sorted out. And your property, uh, your the owners and the property management company were incredibly helpful and we worked well together to find a solution and, and figure out the problem 
problem and, and get that addressed. But we didn't sit there for, I didn't know about that for 30 or 40 days and leave no water. I guarantee you the day that I knew, we brought the engine down here and we supplied water to that system. It doesn't make up for however long it didn't have the pressure, but it, it's, a, it's a misunderstanding if you think that it sat there for that long. The, the access in and out, it's a problem. There's a few different, there's a few areas in town that I have a, a huge concern. Um, I was on the fire at the dock. You know, I was an engineer driving the engine on that and we ran into problems with it then. I can tell you that I could cut through that fence and drive through that fence at any time I want. Um, at, at different, at, that was a lot of discussion about opening 8th Street uh, to keep this part of the area being cut off from downtown. Yeah. It's more of an economic development issue, but uh, I'm not a fire, I'm a fire chief. Yeah. If there was a contingency to get that gate and open it. Yeah, I, well, I, everything you guys were expecting in the, 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 the charge and you know, that, you, that you, the staff is using related ghost fire to the arsenal for whatever reasons. I'm not disputing them, but nevertheless, and then to have only one way in and one way out. I, it's a non-starter. Very, very good point, and we will, we will look into it. This has been a long-standing issue for many reasons, but I was told one time when I have discussed this more than once in front of city council about that, about the egress since that wharf fire that had the wind been blowing this direction instead of across the bridge, we would have been having that creosote fire in our studios, in our living spaces, in and in our lungs. And already we deal with a lot, all, you know, because the coke tower is right there, but but I'm telling you, a guy told me, oh, you can always, if the, if the gate's locked, you can always just drive your car through it. And I thought, don't tell me to drive my car through a fence. You know, and that's the kind of answer we're getting. And that's an insult to all of us because we should have egress from this area. That is, you know, in an earthquake, I've used that example, the earthquake, if that takes down the Polk Street overpass to Grant, if it, if, even if that's a little little bit damaged. We know you could close it off for fear of concrete dropping on a car or a person. What happens? Who's gonna, who are we going to count on to open up that gate? These proper, you know, Valero ought to be a part of that. Amparts be a part of it for safety reasons. Thank you. My name's Jen Tuff and I own the gallery over here. And um, I just have to say that ever since Ghost Ship, artists in the Bay Area are under attack. You know, I mean, their studios are getting closed down because tech companies are moving in there. I hear this every day. You know, I mean, the artists here need to be protected by the city. You know, I don't know if that involves some sort of like subsidies to take care of this so their rent doesn't go through the roof because I don't know how their rent isn't going to go through the roof with $100,000 worth of repairs. So I just think that there has to be really like nurturing and taking care of this incredible community here because there's nowhere else for people to go. There really isn't. I mean, people are coming out of San Francisco, they went to Oakland, and now they're coming up here. I'm Arthur Stern. My situation is a little bit different in that I have a business next door to an artist live work studio. I'm the big building over on the end there. The Allens didn't want to divide up the space. They said, take the whole building, which I did. So the Allens were responsible for the bathroom and the kitchen and took out a permit for that. I took out a permit for the leasehold improvements that I did and I provided architectural drawings uh, which unfortunately the, the building department can't find uh, you know, my uh, information. Uh, not only did I have architectural drawings but I did revised architectural drawings based on the critique of the building department and then we did a completely professional build out. I was inspected after the framing. I was inspected after the electrical. I was inspected after the sprinklers, which were done by a professional sprinkler company. I was inspected after the heating was installed by a professional heating company. I was inspected after Benicia Plumbing did the plumbing in the building. I was inspected after the insulation was done. Every step of the way, I was totally transparent, I was totally legal, and my space 
was like a showpiece for the Allen family. The mayor, the city council would all bring people to my space to show what could be done down here. Nobody had been in my building for, I think, a decade before I moved in there and resurrected it. But now they're telling me that I have too many square feet for, <laughs> for a live work studio. They're telling me that things that passed code 25 years ago no longer pass code. I chopped a hole in the concrete wall to make a fire exit from the bedroom. It's 11 feet from the bedroom. It's not in the bedroom, but this passed code 25 years ago. I got the occupancy. I've been in there ever since. You know, we lived there pretty quietly for many years. Some of you remember Frank Egan blew himself up on the loading dock doing, doing some casting. Uh, non fatal. Non fatal. But, but there was an explosion. Yeah, maybe, fifth, maybe 15 years ago. Then all of a sudden, the, the fire department got really interested in what was going on down here. And we were subjected to, you know, big time inspections at that point. They went through everybody's space. Nobody found anything in my building. Everybody walked through and said, up to code. We've been having fire inspections, and admittedly, you, you mentioned that it wasn't people who are experts at this, it was your firemen uh, going through, but I've passed inspections for 25 years, and to, to be yellow flagged for things that, you know, were, were passed by the, the building in the city uh, just doesn't make sense to me. If there's, if there's changes in the codes, can, can we be grandfathered in if this passed code 25 years ago? Do I need to get my attorneys involved and talk to the city attorneys? How do we go about doing this? If there's things, the Allens were responsible for everybody's kitchen. Anything that's a live work, the Allens did the kitchens. Now they tell me there's no hood over the stove. I don't think anybody has a hood over the stove. This all passed building inspection 25 years ago when this complex was started, and we've passed fire inspections year after year after year. Why does it take 25 years for somebody to say, you need hoods over the stoves? And who's going to pay for the hoods over the stoves? You know, the Allens did the build out for the kitchens and the bathrooms, but with each successive property management company, the artists have had to sign new documents, making more and more of the building's responsibility on us. It, now it says, if anything happens to the kitchen or the bathroom, it's our responsibility to fix it. In a big storm last year, one of my clear story windows blew out, a major part of the building. Uh, Erica wrote me that, you know, section C3B on your month-to-month -month lease, a lot of us don't have uh, leases beyond a month-to-month, -month, is, is my responsibility. I had to pay to repair the structure of the building. So I think there's a lot of people at fault here. The building department is unorganized if they don't have the blueprints. The fire department is unorganized if the inspections haven't been up to date. But I've been totally transparent all through this process, and I know a lot of us have. This is no ghost ship here. Uh, and I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of blame to be shared, but uh, I don't want to be penalized uh, if the codes have changed. I think there should be some grandfathering in. If I passed all the codes when Benicia made a live work ordinance and my building was designed and passed all the codes, it should pass codes now. So I don't think we're in a position to comment on case by case, but we're certainly hearing what you're saying. And I know that um, in our staff level that Rachel has talked about some examples of um, issues 
and I know that she's uh, offered to work with each of you individually to figure out what we have, what you have, et cetera, and then work with the property owner to try to figure out how to meet the, comply with the requirements in the best possible way. I just want to say that um, I have addressed that to the city's attorney as far as items being grandfathered in because I completely understand. I've sent e um, Eli emails as well as Rachel, so they are looking into that as far as what they can consider grandfathered in because I am in complete agreement with all of you. Um, as far as the smoke detectors and carbon monoxide, I'm questioning that because the property manager that was prior to me stated that everything was installed, that was, that was done. So my question when I read the 140 page report was, why is that on the report? Why are these tenants being responsible for items that should have already been done, that I've been told that was done? And I know there were numerous fire inspections done. Kathy Rambliss, um, I've been speaking with her directly, and she was out here. She dealt with Kent Allen, the owner, and because he had questions for her. So I guess my concern, or my question is, how they passed these fire inspections when they originally came out months ago, um, as well as another item on the um, report was that they must take all of their furniture, remove it, get it out of here when their work live or live work. That was a question to me because now I've got all of my tenants frantic wondering where they're gonna lay their head at night. And that was a cause of concern for me, the attorney and the owner, because I didn't want them feeling that they had no place to sleep or to live when they're being told that all of their furniture needed to be removed. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to let you guys know that we are working as far as any items that were considered grandfathering in windows, fire escapes, and such that I will be addressing that with Eli as well as with Rachel and whomever else is on the team and I will work as, as diligently as I can to ensure that that's something that can be grandfathered in. Thank you. Okay? I just wanted you to know. Hi, I'm Susan. Um, I'm a person who had to move out of my bedroom. And this is kind of an, an issue because sleep is really the issue. But the other big issue is to, we're losing what, five, 600 square feet of usable space that we are paying for. And there's no indication as to what time period we're looking at where we don't have a place to live or cook. So in going forward, I would like to request that there is some reasonable time period to expect uh, when we can move back into our bedrooms and occupy that space that we are paying for, and uh, also when we can begin to cook again, because that's, a, that's something that affects our day-to-day -day life. So. I'm Diane Williams. I am a longtime um, artist here in the arsenal. And one thing that hasn't been brought up about our community is what a wonderful community we are. And I just want everyone to know that in the Bay Area, people love the Venetia Arsenal because it's such a safe place. And we weren't really talking about fire codes. We were talking about the fact that we can walk around at night and feel safe, we're secure. Um, it's a wonderful community. And that is because it's made up of wonderful individuals who look out for each other and have for decades. Um, I believe it was Catherine uh, that, well, Renfro that sent out an email today um, from Andrew Allen, or it was an article about Andrew Allen and his original vision for the arsenal many, many years ago. And that vision has come to pass for such a long period of time. This is a healing community for many, many reasons. Artists have been able to afford to live, to work, and therefore to become blue chip artists because we've been offered, afforded the time and the, the, the place to do it as a community, a tight knit community. Um, one thing that bothers me is that we are not offered leases and we would like leases. We'd like to know that we can keep this community intact 
um, because it is such a special place. So I hope that um, in the long run, when all is said and done, we'll be a safe community in every respect. Um, and I know that the city does have our cooperation as artists. So um, I just want to thank everybody for so many years um, being a supportive community. I'm Robert Nelson. Uh, I'm a small player here in the Arsenal. But uh, I just have uh, one thing I want to impart to this group, and, and including the city staff. Um, I think we're kind of in agreement on safety is in everybody's best interest, the city staff and all the residents and occupants here. Electrical cords and, and smoke detectors, fine. Then it gets to what do we do about some, some of the, more, the larger issues, and I start hearing things like removal and demolition, and that gets people really anxious. Uh, I want to tell you my background, and that was I was a planner for Napa County for almost 40 years, and we shared the floor with the building department, so we worked side by side. There were a lot of cowboys in the rural areas of the county, and for instance, one party built a housing compound up by Lake County that got discovered. It was three houses, a barn, all the electrical work, water, sewer, no, no inspections whatsoever. Did the county make people remove these things? No. They worked diligently with everybody that, that had illegal, non-inspected situations and said, you know, we'll, we'll try to get you to, to conformity with the code or as close to it as possible. We can do x-ray of the concrete to see if there's rebar. We can have you pull some sheetrock off to see what the studs spacing is and what the nailing is. I don't think we ever made anybody tear anything down even though it was blatantly done illegally. So I'm just hoping that we can hear from the city staff, even though it's new people and everybody has a paranoia about the ghost ship, that we're gonna work with the people here and try to make everything as close to legal, make everything safe anyway. Um, an, an inspection that was done back in March of 2014, and it had, it was about 140 pages just as this, and it had everybody's suites in there and what was pre-existing. So I am going to make photocopies of that and I will send it to Eli and Rachel and everybody so that we know where the baseline was, where the original uh, or an inspection was done in most recent years. Um, and also with regards to the modern day code, that's something that I've been bringing up to Eli as well to see, you know, as far as the items that were in, I think it was in your room that um, you didn't have fire sprinklers in there and, and such, that we will be addressing. The owner obviously will be taking care of it. Fire sprinklers. Or in the rooms, the egress in your rooms. So we wanted to see what was actually, um, what passed the inspection back in 2014, because this is new to me, so I've, I've been diligently working and reading these reports to make everything as easy as possible to to see where we can have our baseline and go from there um, um, and if there were any permits I reached out to the original contractor that I've left several messages today I'm just waiting to hear back to see if he has any permits something is better than nothing that I can provide to the city that way we could start somewhere um, and one other thing, as far as the, the, the funds that the owner is going to be giving all of you, this is not something that's going to raise your rent. I can tell you that right now. This is something that is an obligation that the owner is going to have and that he wants you to know we have your back, that we're going to do is whatever we can to do to help bring this building up to code. You guys don't have to worry about that. If you've installed smoke detectors, um, obviously just everything's going to be reimbursed if you've already purchased it. I don't want you all to feel that it's going to be something that's out of your pocket and you're responsible for it because that's not true. So I just wanted you to know that. That, that's an improvement, but I've expressed to many of you the, the increases that we had last year were substantial. And I know you all didn't have increases for, what, 20 some odd years. Um, oh, you have. Oh, see, I was told differently. I was told by the, the previous property manager they didn't raise rent. So he did a substantial rent increase. So, 
so going to be as what they were no definitely not there's some res there's responsibility he's taking to help beautify this community because you know he knows as far as the artists that are here that i have a good relationship with you guys and he's hoping to continue it that's not he doesn't run want to run anybody out we just want to help um. Uh, about this issue of egress uh, for bedrooms were designed by Joe Garcia, an architect who happened to be the son-in-law of um, a, con um, a council member at the time, Jerry Hayes, who became our mayor. And that must have gone through permitting because Joe did a great job for Andy Allen designing these spaces, dividing them up with a galley kitchen facing the back, let's say in this building, and a bedroom and a closet area, and then the larger portion was to be for workspace. To ask egress off the back side of this building, like for fire escapes, what? Um, that was not part of the original design. That had to have been permitted. I, I don't live down here. I have a house that I've had for 30 some odd years now, and um, I have to get permits to do new construction, and at that time, other things are checked, like do I have a CO2 yeah. combined with a 10-year battery, you know, the 10-year battery, all that stuff. So you come up to code when you try to do something new, but to ask people retrospectively to do something that they've had no notice of, you know, so it really is the responsibility of Kent Allen to take care of these big issues, but um, you have to go back. The city has to understand that this was permitted, these bedrooms. And to break into these walls, I doubt Ken can do that. So the big issue is egress from bedrooms so people can put their beds back in the bedrooms. They can use the, the kitchen without a hood because all they have to do is open the window because the, the, the galley kitchens, as far as I know, are on that back wall facing um, Jackson Street. A lot of homes don't have hoods over. That's, you know, fancy stuff. Uh, Linda Grebmeyer, an artist here for 22 years. We have our studio upstairs above this building, and to follow what Marilyn was saying, it, we moved in and it was already designed by the uh, management, and it was set up where the front section, about 60% was work, the back section was 40% was live, was the bedroom, to the kitchen with a heater, which was the only heat provided which for the living area. They did not need to provide heat for the work area. So now having, and then there was no egress set up there. And, um, but for us now to move, we've moved all of our bedroom into the living room, <laughs> right? And it's the same thing as we have no heat now. So we will have no heat because there's no heat in the front section. So it really has to be understood of how these were designed, approved earlier for the use in this particular building that I know about. I just have a process question. So we know there'll be more inspections. We know there'll be a timeline. But who's doing the approval? Who's, who's driving all that? What's the team that's going to be making these approvals? Because part of what's happening here must also involve an insurance company insuring the city. So if the insurance company has a role in checking boxes and approving things, I'm uncomfortable with that, I'll just be honest. But if it's you guys in your professional capacity approving things, then I feel a little bit better about that. Well, I don't think that there is a role for our uh, insurance company, partly because we're self-insured. Um, but I believe that this is a question that maybe Rachel could talk a little bit about, just what next steps that they might expect. So the question was next steps. So the next step will be for the property management to meet with us regarding permitting history. So once we have a clear view of what we have and what the um, owner has, we can compare and look at each every unit individually because they are different from unit to unit. So at this point, we're gathering information and waiting for the property management to reach out. Hi, Kim. No. I'm sorry. Um, the question was, while this is going on, are people going to be able to move back in their bedrooms? And the answer was no. And I would propose that a timeline be established and given to everyone so we know what the heck's going on. You know, I, I think that would be reasonable. And since they've been living in the bedrooms for 20 years, what's the harm of letting them stay there another two weeks while this gets done? Well, they've got smoke and fire detectors now. 
and, and I, if I can tag onto that, um, this building primarily is concrete and steel. So let's be, let's be clear that the, that the go ship was a tender box ready to go. A couple questions. In the letter today from the city manager, uh, it says here that um, the, once you uh, began to evaluate the department's inspection program, you focused on properties throughout the city that were identified as a, quote, serious threat to life safety. I'd like to know what those other properties are and how hard you're coming down on them. So, I mean, just off the top of my head, the one, another one that was bothering me was the Portuguese Hall. I go in there and there's crab feeds with hundreds of people. There's egress issues. There's, there's just, there was all kinds of issues and we came down hard on them. We're still coming down hard on them. They had, we made them put in a full hood system. Um, they're significant. Are their daily lives affected? No. There are, there are times where there are hundreds of lives affected. And so, yeah, Versus here? They don't live there. Yeah. They don't live there. Well, you, you, what, other, what other properties are you inspecting and focusing on when it comes to a serious threat to life safety? I just feel we're being targeted. Okay. Well, I, I, you're, you're not. You're not being targeted. There's nothing specific about you that's being targeted. The specific thing is that it's a concern that there's significant life safety. If you read, if you read the 143-page report, it's pretty clear that there are some significant issues here. I'm not going to argue, and everyone here is willing to comply. Don't misunderstand. We are all hardworking professionals who play by the rules. That's why we've been here for so long. And Diane's right. It's a great community that, by the way, contributes to the city in a variety of ways. So let's be clear about that as well. What I'm concerned about is what I feel is a targeting, because it states right here that you're inspecting other properties, and I'd like to know what they are. I, Other than the hall. I could give you a list. You can come down to the firehouse tomorrow and I'll give you a list of all the properties we've inspected in the last year if that makes you feel comfortable. I'm I just feel like it's impossible to go to all the homes and say, you know, you, you need to pull all your extension cords. I mean, really, really. It's a question maybe better for the building official, but you're allowed to use, like it got mentioned, can you use an extension cord for this? You can for temporary use. You can't daisy chain extension cords together. You can't use them in lieu of permanent wiring. And I, I would assume that it came from past history of fires and people getting hurt. That's where almost all of the codes come from. I read the code. They are UL listed certified for 90 days. So when you put an extension cord in, you can leave that extension cord for 90 days without disturbance. At 90 days, you've got to, it's a temporary measure, obviously. But this goes back to my point of when can, since people have been living here peacefully with no fire and no damage and no incident for decades, why can't they go back in their bedrooms and go to sleep at night? I mean, come on, really. And I'm not trying to be difficult, but it makes sense. My only simple answer for that is that we didn't know. And once we know, we have an obligation. That's, that's my only answer for that one. Tom Lipton, uh, been here about nine years. Um, I guess I have a question. What is the occup occupancy zoning for these buildings? Is it commercial? Is it mixed use? What is it exactly so we can do some of our own research? Yes. I don't know what is it. 3R, 2B, 9Z, I, uh, I'm not clear on what it actually is, because it's mine. It's a, it's a residential classification, and you go to the bu building and fire code, and it changes the rules for different things that are allowed, and it's just, it's, I don't know how, I can't explain it better than that. Well, one of the things we'd be happy to do is a follow up with answering. Thank you. And project. Okay, sorry. So we, I, we are collecting questions like that that we can follow up. So like tomorrow or um, tomorrow's Tuesday or Wednesday, we can send you out an email with a better answer to your question. Okay, and I think I have all of your emails now. So you have something else? Here's the planning wrap up that makes right here. My second question is for the property manager, and um, the, uh, I forgot what it was. <laughs> oh, you mentioned $100,000. Where did that number come from? The owner. 
And was that a pledge by the owner? Yeah. Is that per unit? Is that aggregate? Is that the whole thing or what? Uh, it's for all units. All units. Okay, so I can speak for myself. After my sprinkler inspection, I had a private contractor, a sprinkler contractor come in, go through my unit. His estimate was $30,000. Okay? So I think that $100,000, uh, it needs to be reevaluated. Okay? And uh, a little bit. And this is a huge job, I, I, and I understand that. This is a massive job, okay? And the coordination that you have to do, I'm sorry, but I have pretty low confidence that, uh, that it's going to get done in any kind of timely fashion, okay? I have a riser in my unit that has a valve that is cor so badly corroded that it's leaking, okay? There's a, there's a section of it, the valve is cracked in half. I've reported this for... Five months now, no action, absolutely no action. So that's my benchmark. We asked for the trees to be trimmed. Somebody fell down on the loose leaves over there the other day, okay? No action. So I'm nervous, okay? We need to comply or else, okay? And this is, and I'm not poking at you, okay? This is not personal, but pretty slow, okay? Pretty slow, these things are very serious matters. I worked for the government during the NAVE for Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I deal with our fire chief there on uh, all kinds of things, right? And they have a job to do. I get it, okay? And, uh, um, and sometimes it's really complicated, and I think this is really complicated. Okay. So. Um, if, you've if you can check your email, the electricians are due, the electricians due to be here the week of the 3rd of September as well as a plumber. So they can assess any items that need to be addressed, whether it's electrical or plumbing. If there's an item for the fire sprinklers, um, that is with station one, and I'm meeting with them on Thursday. I'll be out here. Uh, I know they've been trying to address, I know there's items within each individual suite that I need to gain access to, and not everybody is available at the time that I need to to gain access. So sometimes it can be a bit of a challenge that I try to coordinate with any and all. I understand and I appreciate every one of you, um, but I, ch I have to do you know my job to try and gain access. And I understand everybody's got day jobs as well. Um, so I try to do my best to accommodate everybody involved that I need to gain access, risers and, and splinker and such. <laughs> you, send out, you send out an email and you say, the sprinkler guy is going to be here from 8 a.m. to 12, be available, or we're going to have a locksmith there standing by to open your What door. I've said was that they have to come and gain access. If you're not available, that I can give a 24-hour notice that we can gain access. Well, if it's something that needs to be addressed, then I will just have to serve a 24-hour notice to gain access. A lot of you, I try not to do that because I understand you have certain items that are within your suites that you don't want anybody getting near and that's I understand that so I have to schedule and unfortunately my hands are tied when I have contractors whether it be alarm tech station one um, the city uh, anybody that I have to come out here they give me a window there's never a time where I can say they're gonna be at your suite at 1005 so please be there they give me a window and I do my best to make sure that I get that win window down at least to a two-hour window so I understand that. This trees out there, I've taken 40 plus trees out there. Those two trees, I've been to the city. They will not allow me to get those torn down. So I have another landscape. So I've had a landscaper go out there to give me a quote to do the trimming. So it's not something that's uh, unfortunately not an instantaneous item um, that is addressed automatically. Um, so, you know, I've done what I can to allow any contractor to gain access. And I apologize if you feel any other way, but I know I've done what I need to do to allow anybody to gain access in any of the suites. So what are, what are people's ideas of the timeline to get people living in their bedrooms again and to be able to cook in their units? What? Okay, I'm just asking the city, what is your optimistic timeline to get people to sleep in their bedrooms again and to be able to cook in their kitchens? Is that upon the electrician becoming a kitchen in individual suites? Is that what it's... 
So if I can see if they can speed it up, is, would that speed so, the speed? Sleeping in the suites is going to be on a case-to-case -case basis, so we'll be working on with each unit what their permits look like, what they were approved for, and what they have today, because some of them are pretty old that we're dealing with. So we'll be working with the property management to get what they have, and then to have go over what the city has, which is in the pack, back of packet A. I believe everybody had the permitting history that the city has. So once we can look at and see what you have, we'll have a better understanding of if your bed can go back in and how fast. So make sure you reach out to your property management if you were one of the ones that had to move your bed out of the suites, okay? The plumbing and electrical, we need to find out what, what happens once the professionals come through. Judy Kendall, I don't, I'm, hi Judy. Um, so I had a plumber go out um, per, their, per the report um, that her water heater was red tagged and she's not able to operate her water heater. I had a plumber come out here today um, and he said that there was a type B ventilation that was required in order for her to turn her water heater back on, which she's a work live and she needs her hot water, obviously. So now it comes to an HVAC contractor that needs to come out, which he'll be out here this week. But I guess for the, the, the tenants that have those, um, can I get the, I mean, is it, if it's a ventilation problem, and in the binder that I have, everything was, it was um, marked off as, as okay, everything was operational. So is that something that can be addressed right away that I can email to you guys a report tomorrow and you guys take a look at and see if that's something that would deem it okay for her to operate her water heater again? If you, in fact, don't have a B vent, the um, water heater is in non-compliance because it's single wall instead of double wall. So the HVAC company that would come out would need to pull a permit to revent it. No, we're talking about the, the flu that comes off the top of the water heater is the incorrect flu. They don't have the right flu on there. So you have um, chances of carbon monoxide and fire where it could, I don't know what each individual one looks like, but the intent is the code requires you have a double wall B vent on a water heater. So I just want to reiterate once more, we've voiced grievances. The city has given us explanations and a lot of them make sense. But I think it'd be a shame to leave this meeting without an action item list of what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and who's going to do it. Otherwise, we're all going to drift out of here with no conclusions and no better idea of what's in our future than we have right now. So let's, let's just put our heads together and figure out what the city can commit to, when they're going to do it, and how that affects us. Please. So the commitment we have right now is to clear your 72-hour notices. So you'll be getting reinspections for the immediate items that needed to be fixed in each unit. The second part of that will be at that time, property management needs to approach us with their permitting history and a list of what, letting us know what their plan is at this time. We don't have those answers. What's, what's the deadline for that? We have not discussed deadlines at this time. We're working through the 72-hour process right now. So I'm waiting from him. Now, if that gentleman doesn't call, what's my recourse? If they're saying, if the, the owner is saying that permits were pulled and the city can't obtain these permits, then what happens? And, that, and, that, and that's, I guess that's where I'm at a loss, especially for Arthur Stern, if his permits aren't found and they're lost. Listen, uh, I, I'm thinking of more, maybe what we need here, you know, based on what I've heard so far, is more of a practical solution. Would not what Bob said earlier be a practical solution is we establish a priority structure matrix, okay, for making the decisions. Basically, what I'm proposing is that if permits aren't available, you know, based on whatever. First of all, I think you should prioritize the, the artists that are living or actually living. 
I'm willing to take a back seat because my wife and I live in Vallejo. We use our studio commercially, so I'm not sleeping there. I don't have to worry about it. And the people that are sleeping and cooking, I think they get first priority. That's first priority structure. Second priority structure is, is if you don't have permits and we can't obtain permits, that the city agrees to come through if reasonable, open up the sheetrock, do what we got to do to take a look, make sure things are built soundly and everything is okay. Do a retro permitting process, okay? Retro permit them, get them inspected, make changes where needed, then we can move on. It seems to me to be a very practical, clear solution. Can we get a commitment like that? So at this point, the property management would have to come in with as-builts and do opening it up and letting us know what's in there. So at this point, we're waiting to see the outcome of the report that they've been given and how they choose to address the items. And they can, will approach the city at that point and we'll have a clear understanding of, of what needs to happen. And I agree the ones with uh, the live workspaces that are out of their bedrooms and things like that. But I don't get to make those decisions. It'll be through the property management. So, hi, my name is Maria, and I'm Mark's wife. I live here in this building. I haven't met you, Erica, yet, so I'm one of the tenants here. Um, what I kind of see here and here is that the city loves to have this community here for many reasons, and you love to call this community Benicia's community, right? Um, and on the other hand, you know, property management, I love your tattoo, by the way, uh, because it speaks of the importance of family. And this here, when I moved into this community, I was so grateful to feel that I had a family because I moved from Europe. So for me, that this is the, I mean, if I moved anywhere else, I don't think I would be as happy and feel protected and feel that I can always go to my next door neighbor and ask for help if I need to. This is something that I was used to in Europe. And this community gave me that sense of home and family. So, you know, we all like to call something our own until there is a problem. And then we like to delegate the problem to someone else. When everything is okay, Oh yeah, this is our community and it's all good and fine. But when there is a problem, well, it's someone else's responsibility. And I feel here that even though the letter was addressed to the owner, you know, then the deadlines apply to us. So who has here the responsibility to protect us? I don't know. I don't get it because I don't think the city is communicating that apart from saying, well, we want you safe which is a legitimate uh, you know, statement, but there is more to that. And then you know, the property management say, oh yeah, no, we like you, but then you know, you're gonna deal with it and you're gonna pay for it because I don't know. And I'm sorry, Erica, but you know, I've personally tried to reach you with some concerns and issues before all of this. I never got an answer. And this, these notices were posted on the 19th and we heard from you on the 21st. And this was a major blowout. And it took a day and a half to hear from our property management what the hell is going on. And the city is saying, well, you knew about this. So you knew about it. You could have reacted faster, or you could have warned us, hey, this is coming up. And take care of us, you know, as human beings, which, you know, we have older people here, we have people that have lived there for so long, we have people that don't really have the means to pay for some of these issues. So at least take care of the family by letting them know what's going on. Because it's not all about the money, it's also about human beings. We, we live here, we have emotions, we have needs, we need to sleep and to cook. So, you know, I, what I would like and from what I hear here, there's a lot of ping pong going on and responsibilities being, you know, shooted across the room and no one can guarantee anything and okay, but at least keeps us informed. So send us an email. If you are trying to reach to someone and that person is not responding to you, let me know. Hey, I'm trying to reach this. He's not responding. She's not responding. So let me get back to you tomorrow in five days. But when I try to contact and get information and I hear silence, I don't feel like I'm part of this family. I feel like I'm somewhere in the back room. It's like, deal with it. I still don't know who's going to pay for any of this. I have no guarantees because I know what my contract says. So, you know, we can all pull the contract, 
when it comes to that. Then there is no family and no love. There is a contract. So I don't know if the city can do something about, and I, I think it's a good idea from Jen to in some way help this community if the costs basically come back to us because you want safety, you want safety, but we have to pay for it. So that's, I think, all I had to say. Thank you. And just case in point, and Erica, you have a tough job. I was a property manager years ago, so you have a tough job, I get that. But in terms of a quick response, just case in point, we have three windows that I've talked to you about over many, many months. They're rotted out. When the place got painted, we were told that that was not our responsibility, they would be replaced. After many emails that got unanswered, finally a guy came out, looked at it and said, you're right, you've got three rotted windows that need to be replaced. Never heard from him, never heard from you. He never showed back up. That was many months ago. So this is not dump on Erica Knight, but I'm telling you, we need, better, we be, need a better line of communication with you, and, and, and I don't feel it's there all the time. With regards to that's that's what he okay. Well, when I reached out to him, that's what he had said to me that the okay. I will call him and and find out about the window. Um, as far as the notice, as far as the notice, I was out um, on Friday. I received a notice on Sunday. So I understand your frustration because I, I would agree. I don't agree with the delivery. I don't agree with any of that. However, if I had known prior to that, I would have sent the email right away. If, if I, I could, I'll send you the email when I received it. I mean, I, I, that's not something that I'm, if I have contractors coming out, I'm sending you guys emails. I'm not trying to not correspond with any of you. I have an email when I was out, um, I got it Friday, and when I read it, it said that they were supposed to, I want to say it was go out on Friday to do the notices, and when the they were posting them on, on the 19th, um, and that was after me talking with the owner's attorney as well. Isolate incident because you know um, you I know. You, uh, uh, okay. Um, excuse me. Hi, I'm May. I've been here since 1992 when I was young. Now I'm old. So anyway, Erica, um, I don't mean to pick on you, but this is not the first. This is not a. Um, there's a pattern when I try to call you. Like for instance, in, in 2014. <coughs> One day, there was a yellow post, this is before you came, and um, they gave us 30 days to eradicate our, our beautiful gardens. And if they, you know, that was, that was under Kent Ellen. But anyway, so um, I would love it if you um, answer our email or our call in a really good time. That would be really help helpful because I've, sometimes I've left a lot of message. I feel like I'm a, you know, pest. But, these are real, I wouldn't call unless I have important questions. And also, when I really want the building and department to clarify this term. Erica said there's a difference between work, live, and live, work. We are no longer live, work. But I found out there's no such thing as work, live, because you told me this is now work, live, that when we raise the rent, you could literally raise the rent a day before, and it's legal. That's, I have never heard that. This is what you told me. Because usually you, you give, there's a decency of 30 days notice. That's pretty quick. But when I question you, the last raised, which is recent, it was less than two weeks. And so you said that if it's a day before, it's legal. And if you don't like it, you could leave. That was never said. Oh, no, yeah, you did. I, it got, you said there's no such, why would I make, you know, oh, Erica, I don't want, I want, 
I am not, but I just said I have never heard of work, live. But every, every time someone has mentioned it's live, work. So the first time you said this is a new thing, it's work, live. Because that's what was expressed to me from Carol previously. But, but, you're, but I've never heard that from Carol. Anyway, I'm not here to give you a bad time. I'm just Can, I know. I just have a specific question. I'm going to break this up a little bit for the um, officials, the fire officials that are here regarding something on our notification that is kind of a safety issue. And that is the notice on the door that this door shall remain unlocked during uh, when occupants are present. Well, so what? We're sleeping in our beds at night with the doors unlocked. Is that reasonable in a live workspace? What, what are we to do about that? I believe some people, some businesses are open to the public, some are not. So they were written up. And if yours turns out to be one of the ones that is not open to the public, then we'll address that comment when we get to that, to get to your unit. So everybody's unit will be addressed separately. So when I'm working, I, I like to close the door, meaning don't bother me. I'm an artist, I'm working. I'm not selling anything. I don't have things displayed for people to come in and, and see what's going on. It's a, it's a working studio, not a gallery, so there's a difference between those things. We open uh, twice a year. You can get an extension cord with a surge protector at any length. So if you want to run an extension cord, just buy one with a surge protector. Yep. I, I believe that's correct. You can use a, you can use a, a extension cord with a surge protector. The problem is most of them, they sell them really short. And then people will, like I called, I said before, daisy chain other ones on. You can't do that. But if you can go someplace and find a 20 footer or something and it has a, a fuse, like it has the light and the switch, then I believe that's allowed. Correct. Okay, I'm Sam. Most of you know me. I've been here since 92. Um, we have a studio there. We do not live in it. I live on military, and my son lives down by K Way. Um, the fire department came in and said, we had a couple lofts, we took the loft out, the sprinklers can come down, it's fine. We did that, now they come in and say we want all the walls out. Okay, I understand there's been fires and a lot of people have died and the city definitely does not want to be sued and Andrew's family does not want to be sued. So that leaves someone like me who has maybe $100 in the bank that's going to get sued, who's going to get it? We all have to have a million dollars worth of insurance, so maybe it can come out of there. But I don't think so. I think it's just a matter of greed. No one wants to pay, and they want the people who are in the studios to pay. We have a month-to-month, -month, everyone here, I believe, has a month-to-month. -month. That means if we spend three, four, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 on the building, we can still get thrown out next month, and someone can come in who can afford to pay more money. And the rent has been going up ever since Andrew left and his brother taken over. The other thing is the city, we've got a hold of the city several times about the elevator. The elevator floods, water comes up in it. We had the city come and look. They looked at it. We had Benicia Plumbing come and look. We had everyone come and look. The city came and said, it's city water. It wasn't coming from our pipes. We've been pumping the water out ever since then, telling the city that's what we're doing, pumping it down the drain back out to the city during the drought. The city's big deal on the drought. Put special meters in all your houses so you don't lose a couple ounces because overall, the city's going to lose money. But this elevator fills up with water like to here if we don't have pumps. Now, I will say they've been buying new pumps when they burn out. But my son has to go down there, plug it in, get it going every time, and the city can't find anything wrong until those hydrants broke down that run along there we were talking about. The hydrants broke down, and they shut them off, and the leak went away. We told the city the leak went away when the hydrants went down. So they hooked hoses up to them, and the leak came back. And they did whatever else they were going to do, put a big pipe in, and now we're pumping water out every day, every 30 minutes. 
because the city does not want to deal with how much it's going to cost to tear up the street. So it's all about finances. But we don't have money. We have, you know, we, a lot of us have jobs. A lot of us are just artists. And also in this meeting, my son was sent out because his son was with him. And I, I don't see no reason like that because he is actually one of the artists. He pays $100 so he can be in open studios. And me, I don't have, I'm not on the lease anymore. My son's been on there for seven years. And when he took it over, not you, but the other, we've had three management so far. Uh, came in and videoed the whole place and everything, said, this is the way it is, it's good, yeah, pay us our rent. And so at this point, now their tenants to tell everything out, they said it was good. And uh, also they come in and say, well, you gotta remove your bed. We don't have a bed, we don't live there. Well, you have a bed, you gotta get out of there, you know. And that just drives my son crazy, because, you know, he already had an Inspire inspector come in, I don't know if it was you or one of your younger ones, but they said, it's fine. You know, you took that out, that's fine. Now it's back to tear walls out and things. And when you tear walls out, you fill up your studio, and you have to go to the dumps. It costs money to go to the dumps, you can't work in your studio for a month, you lost a thousand dollars right there, plus they're going to the dumps. So, you know, it's all about money, and it's all about the city, and I don't think it's fair. I think someone else should be helping with this big time, because, you know, it's thousands of dollars to do something that you're going to only get to be there for a month, maybe. Thank you. Okay, I'm Sam. Most of you know me. I've been here since 92. Um, we have a studio there. We do not live in it. I live on military, and my son lives down by K-Way. Um, the fire department came in and said we had a couple of lofts. We took the loft out. The sprinklers can come down. It's fine. We did that. Now they come in and say we want all the walls out. Okay. I understand there's been fires and a lot of people have died and the city definitely does not want to be sued and Andrew's family does not want to be sued. So that leaves someone like me who has maybe $100 in the bank that's going to get sued, who's going to get it. We all have to have a million dollars worth of insurance so maybe it can come out of there. But I don't think so. I think it's just a matter of greed. No one wants to pay and they want the people who are in the studios to pay. We have a month to month, everyone here I believe has a month to month. That means if we spend three, four, five, ten thousand dollars on the building, we can still get thrown out next month and someone can come in who can afford to pay more money. And the rent has been going up ever since Andrew left and his brother taken over. The other thing is the city, we've got to hold the city several times about the elevator. The elevator floods, water comes up in it. We had the city come and look. They looked at it. We had Benicia Plumbing come and look. We had everyone come and look. The city came and said, it's city water. It wasn't coming from our pipes. We've been pumping the water out ever since then, telling the city that's what we're doing, pumping it down the drain back out to the city during the drought. The city's big deal on the drought. Put special meters in all your houses so you don't lose a couple ounces because overall, the city's gonna lose money. But this elevator fills up with water like to here if we don't have pumps. Now I will say they've been buying new pumps when they burn out. But my son has to go down there, plug it in, get it going every time. And the city can't find anything wrong until those hydrants broke down that run along there we were talking about. The hydrants broke down and they shut them off and the leak went away. We told the city the leak went away when the hydrants went down. So they hooked hoses up to them and the leak came back. And they did whatever else they were gonna do, put a big pipe in, and now we're pumping water out every day, every 30 minutes because the city does not want to deal with how much it's going to cost to tear up the street. So it's all about finances. But we don't have money. We have, you know, we, a lot of us have jobs, a lot of us are just artists. And also in this meeting, my son was sent out because his son was with him. 
And I, I don't see no reason like that because he is actually one of the artists. He pays $100 so he can be in open studios. And me, I don't have, I'm not on the lease anymore. My son's been on there for seven years. And when he took it over, not you, but the other, we've had three management so far. Uh, came in and videoed the whole place and everything, said, this is the way it is, it's good, yeah, pay us our rent. And so at this point, now their parents to tell everything out, they said it was good. And uh, also they come in and say, well, you gotta remove your bed. We don't have a bed, we don't live there. Well, you have a bed, you gotta get out of there, you know. And that just drives my son crazy, because, you know, he already had an Inspire inspector come in, I don't know if it was you or one of your younger ones, but they said, it's fine. You know, you took that out, that's fine. Now it's back to tear walls out and things. And when you tear walls out, you fill up your studio, and you have to go to the dumps. It costs money to go to the dumps, you can't work in your studio for a month, you lost $1,000 right there, plus they're going to the dumps. So, you know, it's all about money, it's all about the city, and I don't think it's fair. I think someone else should be helping with this big time, because, you know, it's thousands of dollars to do something that you're gonna, only get to be there for a month, maybe. Thank you. I just want to clarify something that I had heard that, and this was before Erica, before you became manager and just gone back, is that there was terminology of live, work, to work, live, flip, and I had gone to City Hall to see what the terminology actually looked like in the paperwork. I don't really understand what the difference is, but it, it was, seemed to be used as a premise to change the zoning to a commercial, uh, here, from yeah, but prior to. So that there's something kind of odd in this live work, so I don't know, really know where the parameters li rest as far as responsibilities of the work area, responsibilities of the live area, but that seems to be the basis, is that terminology of uh, kind of a switch of who's responsible for paying what. And I know, I, I know Greg, you, you, you're, you differ, and, and You've enlightened me on that. I'm just going from what I was told from Carol, uh, the previous property manager, and that's, <laughs> so that's, uh, go ahead. There is no work live. The designation is live work, period. End of sentence. Carol Andrews and, uh, and um, I don't want, just hang on. Well, I'm gonna get there in a minute. So Kent, for whatever reason, God only knows, wanted to switch that around. But that's, I was on the planning commission when all these designations were um, put to rest and comfortably, because nobody ever looked at this, the general plan. I have the pages marked. I do have a zoning map here that says mixed use, live work. In any event, um, those definitions came out of nowhere. Someone pulled them out of a hat. It's live work, period. And there's no, there's no, uh, as far as I know, rational or legal basis for, you know, taking apart what's live, what's work, as in terms of assigning responsibility for who pays what. It's a unit, it's a live work unit. It's owned by the Kent Allen Trust right now. And there's an ordinance, a live work ordinance. Correct. If it were revoked or changed. So even if it's in no. City Hall, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Catherine, do you want to speak? Uh, no, I'm Catherine Weller Renfro. Um, <coughs> there's an ordinance that was passed at great effort in 1993, I think, something like that. So, is that still in existence? A live work ordinance on the books? I, I, all I want to say is, you know, a lot of the issues that are being brought up are fire related, yeah. a lot of them are building related. I think that's probably a uh, planning, you know, zoning related question. And like we said before, we can take questions down and get back to you. I think it would be irresponsible for us to try and answer that without knowing completely. So, okay, well, I, there are some questions about that, you know, whether, whether it's part of our code or not, and, and we, we could get back to you on that. Um, I believe I know where some of that confusion came <laughs> from because it started out down here as live work with the ordinance, as Catherine says. But when um, there was a plan for a development on Grant Street for 22 uh, units that were going to be freestanding, like townhouses, crammed on less than an acre. And the, the issue was they were claiming that they would be live work. 
and the argument was, and at that time it was a planning issue, that the proportion of space, first of all, they were going to bring families there. It would be possible to have um, family housing in this area um, with zoned as live work. And I was part of a group saying, you know, um, the proportion of live work is established here where it's about 60-40, let's say. Let's just say there was a percentage identified. And up there, the percentage would be different for the workspace. So there had to be a, a difference because it's not zoned the same as down here. That was my understanding. So I still think there's a lot of confusion and it's not over. <laughs> What's the legal amount of time before a landlord could issue a rent increase? Um, frankly, I can't answer that because um, you know you have to talk to your own lawyer about your landlord-tenant relationship. Um, I cannot, it's actually unethical for me to give you legal advice. I have a client and they're the people who are sitting here with me as the staff. So I'm not able to give you that answer. We can help you find a lot of resources to um, give you some uh, information on those lines, but we, we can't give legal advice about um, timing on the landlord-tenant relationship. Uh, in our property management company, if it's residential, if you have lived in the space for less than a year, it's a 30-day notice in the state of California. If you've lived in the space for more than a year, it's a 60-day notice. If it's commercial, guess what? Day-to-day. 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 So the issue, I think, goes back, and I think Greg has really pointed this out, when you start dealing with this live work, and I went back to the original lease. Do you guys remember that in the original lease, because I had to do this a lot for tax presentation, because that's also what I do for a living, you had to use the space, if it was live work, it was designated in the lease, if for you to be a tenant in this community, you had to use the space 66.67, two thirds, Okay, it had to be artist involved work. Okay, and that was real important. I won several cases with the IRS over that. So I've gone back to that lease. Now, again, I'm just pulling kind of a history so we'll kind of get all back on the same page a little bit. But uh, that, that's what I know. So Eli mentioned that there are some resources that we know about that we'd be happy to share with you. So in that email I mentioned that we'll follow up with information about the zoning, um, we'll also include that information for you. Um, we can't advise you, but there is information available for you. So we'll send that out to you too. And I wanted to do a time check. It's 10 minutes to seven. So we've been here almost two hours and um, I, you know, we were happy to stick around a little longer, but you all also have other lives, I know. Uh, so I thought I would just, like I said, do a time check and see if there's any other questions that we might answer, last minute comments, and maybe we could agree to, to aim to wrap up around seven. I probably have answered it already. Uh, my name is Mike Brown. Uh, I got a call from somebody from the city and I'm confused if it was from building or fire. He, I think his name is Tim Farrell. He's right over there. Where? Raise your hand. Tim. Tim. Where? Tim? Raise your hand. Oh, you're Tim? I'm Tim. Hey, all right. <laughs> My name is Mike. Uh, you called me today yes. about an inspection tomorrow. And I'm assuming that it's for the 72-hour issues. To a degree, yes. I'm going to be looking at it's a real pleasure meeting everyone here this evening. And I commend our police chief and our fire chief, as well as the building official, city staff, because we inherited a situation, as you folks did, and we're trying to get this straightened out to the best of everyone's ability. So it's a matter of just patience. Uh, we're not falling over a cliff yet, okay? But the bottom line is that um, we're going to look into these issues and we're going to be as reasonable as we possibly can in order to make the necessary compliances with life and safety. Because that is our, that is our goal. We don't want to go home as officials, as, as citizens, and see something on the news of a place where we lived at. We do not want that. So I'm sorry, I'm deviating. Your question uh, was? I, um, I wasn't able to take your call today, and you called on, and this is for communication purposes in the city, 
I called you back on your 251 number, but I could not get through. Yeah, I, uh, let me finish, please. And, and so I called, I wasn't sure who to call, I went to the website, I called fire, they gave me a number, I called uh, building, and somebody else called me back who didn't know who you were. <laughs> and so the point is the communication stuff, and I wanted, my question to you then was could I reschedule it for Wednesday, but the point of this whole thing is the communication quagmire. So IT got his phone and his email and his recording set up. It is current good now, but caller ID from a city line will always bounce back a number you can't return. So make sure you listen to the voice message. We should always leave you a phone number to contact us. And the main line, you can always call and they'll transfer you to us too. Um, most of you have my contact information and Tim's is readily available also. Are you guys going to be inspecting other buildings around the arsenal, or are you done? I'm sorry? Other buildings as well. Okay. With a priority to anything that people are living in right now. Do you know which buildings come next? I don't have a list of them. Try to get to the next one. I'm sorry? We are making an attempt to get to every commercial structure. So I'd like to know after the 72, after you come back through and inspect for the 72 hour inspections um, and you guys figure out what's going on with the electrical and the plan with the property management company, are we going to get a similar type of thing if they don't comply? That's 72 hours to uproot our life, figure out where we need to go, pay our bills, life. Um, that's, I, mean, I walked in about 10 minutes late, I might have missed that, but I just want to know. You know, what's the timeline and how are you guys going to communicate it to us if they can't comply so that we can figure out our lives? I would say the short answer would be there'd be no reason why you would get a 72 hour notice because we picked the most critical things that we thought could be done quickly and that's what went in that notice. Everything else we recognize is going to take a little bit longer. I can't right here give you a timeline for how long it's going to take though. We'll do our best to communicate as best as we can. It won't be 72 hours, though. Longer. Longer, not shorter. This is small potatoes, but this is just for an illustration of what you just said. You know, the fire and smoke detectors. 72 hours. We just got back from our trip, so we got an extension. This is our first day back home, and we we're called you today to schedule an appointment. But let's say we have 72 hours to put just, this is minor, I know, but just as an example, to do the fire and, and uh, CO uh, detector, but that is the responsibility of the property manager owner to provide those. And if they don't provide those in the next 72 hours, which I don't think it's the priority on their list to buy smoke detectors, then you know, do I still get penalized because I didn't comply? <laughs> Um, you know, this is another one of those situations where um, we have a relationship with the property owner and you have a relationship with the property owner. You have a lease that, that might be the case, but that is, that is, you have a lease that dictates your relationship with, or, or you, you have an agreement with your, with your property owner and that's what dictates it. Well, the, You, you may want to talk to your own representative to help you with your agreement that you have with the property owner. I just want to mention, yes, I was at City Council and I actually asked that very question about, to please clarify, what was the responsibility of the, of the owner, the property owner, and very clearly was told to me that yes, the smoke detectors, the CO2, those are, and Eric, I did call you, or I wrote you the next day to let you know this is what I had heard directly at the city council meeting, but didn't hear back from you, and luckily William Berg was able to install, even though we already had a fire, uh, smoke detector in the kitchen. He uh, went around very graciously and helped install and also someone, a couple of people have donated money so there probably are still some of these around, Marie. So let's all find out 
Um, I know Williams. Yeah, oh, but I know that what I'm saying is you're absolutely right. What I'm saying, what I'm saying. We are the victims of the lack of communication. Right. Just, you know, just so what I'm saying is you're absolutely right and that we are looking to take care of each other still as a village. And that's really great because I do agree that I think we are going to have to continue to do that. And what I would like, and Janet would mention something to me about having some sort of general place of communication with the city and with us. You had talked about, yeah, yeah, I, uh, let me let it. The city needs to help us on this one and maybe just set up a clearing location so that anybody getting news about this issue can go to that location and see what's happening. Is that something you can do? Because I think that's a great idea. I mean, if, if, if think, for, for people who are ill, there's a thing called Caring Bridge, okay? And you just, get, you just get a little pass into it, and you can see all the postings about your friend's illness. You don't have to call the relatives. You don't have to bother them. You don't have to go to the hospital. Their legal responsibility gets cleared because they complied. So this is what really bothers me, the world responsibility, because what responsibility are we talking about? And I really, I, I, I know that you know, there has been answer was that electricians will be um, called or plumbers or contractors, but you are going to be billed. And this was said loud and clear. So what are we talking about? And this is what the city needs to know in order to maybe potentially understand what the real situation is so that they maybe would be willing to create some sort of program or something to help the artist community that they love to, you know, call their own so much. Because that's the real situation. It's not what's written in the paper, it's what the reality is. The owner was invited to this, was he not? Was the owner invited to this meeting? And did he decline? No, he didn't decline. He medically was not invited. Okay, I just needed to know for clarification's sake. Just r real quick, also, I, I, it's my understanding, f f uh, speaking with the building official, that almost every, I thought everybody had already got their smoke alarms and CO alarms installed. The fire department, you can call us and we'll come down, I'll, I'll send a crew down and, and throw one up. If you need one in your unit, it's not that, it's, it's very simple and not, not that expensive. Thank you. <laughs> and they're not cheap, they're a hundred bucks. So, thank you. carbon dioxide, or monoxide, sorry, monoxide or smoke detectors, send me an email with the receipt if you can. I will gladly reimburse you for that. I will respond to your emails and say confirm receipt so you all know that I received it. It is the building owner's responsibility financially, point blank, for the carbon dioxide. So I, I think I'm just gonna close out. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you all for your comments and uh, your questions. Um, and I think it's going to be a process that unfolds. We will get back to you with some more information on the topics that I mentioned. And um, again, thank you for coming out. Thank you for coming.